Thank you. Thank you. Now, it's flattering, uh, Chris Goward. You are right. So, persuading mobile brains. This is my first time here, um, which is really cool. But I'm a bit of a naughty guy. So I have a little hidden agenda. I have a message which has nothing to do with conversion. And still, I'm going to start with the message. Because uh, I'm from the Netherlands. And there are actually quite a few Dutch blokes around here. Because I saw a few of my clients. Who, who's from the Netherlands? Look at it! Wow! <laughs> so, and who's a psychologist? Oh, where are you? She's there. There's one. Ouch. Ouch. Well. I was talking about the Netherlands. Uh, there's one really cool thing about the Netherlands, and that's that we are a kingdom. I hope you realize that. But we are reigned by uh, these two people. Last year he was inaugurated, our king, Willem-Alexander. It's nothing to do with uh, conversion, but I like to spread my opinion about my king. Because, <laughs> you know, he is in control of... Us, that's him, with, it, with his wife. Yeah. And I'm not going to say a lot about him. I'm just going to show a small video of his uh, New Year's speech and how that goes in the Netherlands. And we have to all listen to, to this. In the verjaardigheid van het dagelijks leven, vaak gericht hier in Kerstmis, een rustpunt. <laughs> that guy is so slow. He's leading us. He's, you know, guiding us to the new digital future, whatever. No, he's not. He's a nightmare. I'm sorry. Man. <laughs> yeah, he's just not my type of guy. Let, let's frame it that way, all right? So he's so rational. He's so slow. There's nothing fun about him, you know. When, when he's deciding, it's all based on rules and logic. And we go, come on, man. This is, this is not human, right? So that's, uh, that's him. Yeah, the last time I saw him, he was really, really struggling to keep attention to the things that he had to repeat that were written down by even by others, like where our country was going. He almost fell asleep. The bastard. There's one really, really cool thing about Willem Alexander, which I really, really love. That's this part. See? <laughs> Maxima. <laughs> Argentina. Yeah, she's not Dutch. Yeah, that's obvious. Yeah. I don't know how he did it. I mean, we're about the same age. <laughs> I didn't pull that one up, but my God, do we have a queen. <laughs> she is pure emotion. She is everything. She cries. She laughs. She's uh, 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 angry, uh, and, she, and she just lets it all go, and that's what I love about uh, my king. If you bring her to a party. Uh, woo! That's, that's my queen, you know. <laughs> Armin van Buren, and she's jumping up and down in a, in a, a dress made of postal bags. <laughs> I love that. So here she is, my really good-looking queen. Um, the opposite of Willem, fast. She never sleeps. She's always partying. She's totally emotional, totally intuitive. Uh, doesn't like rules. She gets naughty, like I love to do. And can do 100 million things at once, totally effortless. There's only one minor disadvantage, and that she has almost no control over her behavior. She just says on national television to her husband, yeah, you're a little dumb. Yeah, that's, I mean, that was not scripted, right? So thank you for listening to my story about how I look, how uh, we are reigned in our country by our queen, who lets our king think he is ruling our country while well, he's not, because we're only looking at her, right? Back to where uh, these guys asked me to come for. Sorry. Sorry for that. Yeah, I'm a psychologist. I um, was born and raised by two psychologists. My only sister became a psychologist. I married a psychologist. It uh, doesn't get any worse than, uh, than me. I like to joke that when we meet at home, we say to each other, hey, how am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> they can laugh. They can laugh. <laughs> so what have I been doing? I have been testing and applying uh, hundreds of insights from psychology. And I've been testing that on the digital uh, media because it's a bit measurable. Right? 
We were calling it A-B testing. Back in the days, we called it stimulus response research. I prefer to call it experiments. And, and yeah, a blog. And it's this site that took a few hours of uh, Sierra's life. Thank you for that. Um, and I indeed make money by uh, looking at consumers, trying to find them more and more with a, with a phone. You know. And money, very important, they must have money. Because then I track them down, target them online, bring them to a website of a client of mine, and make them buy because that client wants their money. And that's what I do, separate consumers from their money. <laughs> and they're all laughing. They're all doing the same thing, right? But they're all laughing. Why is that? I have a few... I have a few uh, Customers, where I'm not allowed to say that, especially financial institutions, they say, no, 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 it's all about customer centric and we do it for us. So, okay. We delight consumers, right? Google does that, does that. We delight consumers, yeah, and we drive conversions. I'll talk about both. Whether you call it users or consumers or customers, I don't care. All I think as a psychologist is that. In fact, we are talking about, I'll do a little trick. Because in every consumer, what's in their head is, ta-da, a brain. Right? You are in the business of either delighting or separating money from uh, 100 billion neuron cells and 1,000 billion glial cells and 1,000 times 1,000 connections between the cells. Nothing more complex than this. Maybe the universe itself has about the same amount of uh, stars and everything in it. So that's quite a challenge, right? And I studied psychology. I was grown up by psychologists. And you know what we know about our brain? Very, very little. Very, very little. But luckily, we have digital, and we can now experiment our ass off to find out what influences that brain. So. That's, uh, that's what I do. Now, how to influence a brain? Uh, yeah, I will do the same. I will uh, ask you. Maybe you know how to influence a brain. I will do only one A-B test to keep it simple, because I saw Chris was doing a lot. Um, what uh, converts better? This is one of my favorite clients. And they have either a pop-up, where everyone clicks the cross or says, I want to go to the website, or just enter on the website. Uh, variation A wins. Can I see hands? Mm, not so much. Variation B then? Yeah, practically all of you. Ow. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> now, so I, I, I picked out this uh, meme, but I saw in here at Google you use this one. So, okay, I use this one. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll help you, because that doesn't make you feel good, right? You're better at this one, I'm sure. So, uh, when guys are asked to speed date, you know, do they want to date with Wilma? Or with Julia. Can I see? Can I just see hands for uh, Julia? Yeah. Yeah. Anyone for, for Wilma? Yeah, yeah, but yeah, you raised your hand twice, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. So let's go into the dating business instead of conversion. Who then knows about the brain? Uh, maybe the brain itself? We can ask consumers? Feedback? Yeah, it could do. You know what happens? This happens. Heeft u een mobiele telefoon? Nee, hoor, heb ik niet. Waarom heeft u dat in? Nou, ik zie dat er niet van in. Dat ben je op de fiets en dan word je gebeld. <laughs> ik heb een gewone telefoon waarvoor moet ik een mobiel hebben. Dat is handig. Maar als ik ergens strand, dan is er ook altijd ergens wel een telefoon zelf, een boerderij met een boer met een telefoon. We hebben jaren zo gedaan en ik vind het wel goed zo. Als mensen mij bereiken willen, dan kunnen ze dat met een brief doen. En on en on en on en on en on. Yeah, the brain doesn't know what it will behave like in the future. Um, it doesn't even know why it's behaving like it's behaving at this right moment. So again, but then I saw, and I took this one. <laughs> the double face palm. Okay. There are people who do know about the brain, although it is very little, and those are scientists. We spend about $4 trillion a year on science, 
And a bigger and bigger part of that goes to the brain. We have very cool projects uh, going with like $40 million budgets and uh, every science like economics and marketing are now turning to the brain science like neuromarketing. We're all very interested in ourselves, which is cool, I guess. What does science tell us in 45 to 60 minutes? <laughs> that's not, that's not going to work. So I'm pointing it down at one thing, which you might know. And, oh, I got another slide in between. Because I'm talking about persuasion, and I always have to tell people, okay, who knows this guy? It's the persuasion man himself. Cialdini. Yeah, Robert Cialdini. Thank you. Yeah, I'm a very big fan of the research he did 40 years ago. And about the book, Influence, that he wrote 40 years ago. And I'm an even bigger fan of all the scientists that wrote really cool books and did really cool research in the last 40 years. That's why I did a little crazy on this picture with him, because I knew I could use it in my slides to look at other good people, like Kahneman winning the Nobel Prize for Economics, being a psychologist. And for me, it's not, of course, that's really, really cool that a psychologist wins the Nobel Prize for Economics. And there, of course, are loads and loads of other real, real, real good researchers. And I'm wanting to make a point, like, people, please, please do more with uh, digging into science, because there's so much cool insights in there. Google Schooler is my most favorite website. So the one thing that I do want to tell you is that um, the book, who, re who read Kahneman? Because it's very popular at the moment. Thinking fast and slow. Ooh. Didn't really happen yet in Ireland. You should buy the book. It's the number one bestseller in the Netherlands at this moment. Thinking fast and slow. So basically, we have two types of processes in our brain. Uh, we call them system one or system two. There are a lot of models. Some call it systematic heuristic. Others call it hot and cold. Others call it uh, central peripheral. But let's just call it system one and system two. And system two is, is the slow part of our brain, which is very rational, which has a huge uh, interesting part of it, which is that it can project mental states into the future. Oh, if I do like this right now, I uh, will feel like that in 30 years. That's the other system cannot do that. Remember that. But, and it's conscious. And that means that if you think about yourself right now, I'm gonna, I am barred. Uh, that's this part of the brain, thinking of itself, conscious. Very, very uh, useful add-on to, uh, to our brain, consciousness. Uh, but the problem is that it requires a lot of attention, and it takes a lot of effort to think consciously and rationally. And, um, and that's why it does not have so much control. It can have control, but not so much, over our system one, which is the very old uh, uh, intuitive, e emotional, automotive part of the brain, right? Enormous capacity. If you've ever heard about the choice paradox, yeah, this is the part that has a problem with choice paradox. This part, totally not. It's, it's a bit like, yeah, I agree. So if I want you to remember one thing, remember in your brain, in my brain, in every customer's brain, there actually, you know, there's not one ruling. Yeah. This one, if you ask them a question, you get an answer of this guy who thinks he rules the brain. But there's this other part, which is much more beautiful, naughty, and fun. And that's why we are such a cool beings. I'll just let it turn for a little bit, because uh, this is the one slide you've got to remember. Well, now, how to persuade two systems at once. First of all, you have to question yourself, who do I want to decide about my offer? And that's the, main, that's the first question when we with our company enter your company, the first thing that we're going to dig into is, do we need an answer from Willem, our system two, rational thinking, or an answer from system one, Maxima, our uh, emotional part of the brain? And it differs. It differs hugely. Uh, for example, uh, this client of ours is selling loans. That's a, that's a very simple trick. You want Willem to be asleep 
uh, exhausted, totally gone, because Maxima wants to buy a car or a new kitchen, and she does not want Willem to notice that you're selling a loan, if you're buying a loan. And is that ethical? Yeah, we should have more discussion about the ethics of what we're doing. And maybe another example, uh, publishers. <laughs> Favorite publishers. Very system one behavior as well. Uh, same for social. We just click around, next article. We are very easily persuaded and uh, uh, very little consciousness going on. One thing that I want to pinpoint as well is that um, as soon as we're having to pay, ooh, the decision becomes more important. And that's when our system two pops up most of the time. So you, we, we can make sure he's so exhausted that he hardly pops up and we sell alone. Uh, but it's not like, you know, I, I hear people saying like, 95% of our decisions are subconscious. Oh, that's bullshit. It's, it's, it, it differs hugely among the phase of the dialogue, the type of market you're in, and the efforts you're doing. Because it's very easy to have the one or the other um, in the brain uh, awake and talking to you. I'm going to pinpoint two major aspects of Willem, because uh, Maxima is very easy. She is very easily persuaded. The, one th the first thing is that he needs energy, mental energy, which is extremely scarce. Your, conscious, uh, your energy for your consciousness is, is depleting very, very quickly. And I'm going uh, to do a little test with that with you, so that you can experience Willem and Maxima in your own brain. Uh, Willem is very good at uh, calculations. I will not make them too difficult, but I'm asking you to, to think in your brain the answer to these, uh, to these uh, calculations. They're not too difficult. Hold on, there are quite a few, but please uh, bear with me. How much is it? You don't, you don't have to say it out loud, just 15, 6, 21. Now think about a color, and think about a tool. There are lots of colors around. Probably half of you was thinking about the color red, and even more were thinking about a hammer. How does he fuck with my mind in that way? I tell you how. <laughs> Well, what I was just doing, this is not my own trick, right? This is a very cool psychologist who thought of it. What I was doing is that I was asking Willem one question after another, right? Just to keep on calculating. And the calculations were increasing in difficulty. Wow, the most difficult one was probably nine, 79 and 22 or something. Wow, that's whew, very, very tough calculations, right? And by the end, uh, he got the final one, and there was an easier question, which was name a color, <laughs> William said, oh, poof, I'm gone. Yeah, Maxima, you answer that one. That one's easy. And therefore, we got the question, we, we got the answer from Maxima. And Maxima's automated. And what is the most prototypical color in Western societies? Red. Don't ask me why. It differs a little bit across countries. In Sweden, it was amazing. I had like 95% of the people thinking red. Um, and a hammer is the most prototypical tool which is also very stupid because a hammer is hardly ever used. We use screws nowadays. nowadays. So it is depleting your system two, your villain, in order to get an answer from system one. This is very easy to apply online on your website to increase your conversion. Or apply it on a mobile, even easier. I'll explain you later on why. There's a lot of scientific research done to, uh, to depletion. If we ask people to remember 39, uh, hey, that's easy. Or another group, a large number. And then we say, thank you for remembering. Now you can choose your reward. What would you choose? Chocolate cake or the healthy choice? And we see that people who got the 
uh, uh, who have little energy left, they choose, choose the cake much more than the fresh salads. Whereas you only have to remember 39, it, it's about, uh, about equal. Just because you're uh, losing control, rational control of your behavior, and hey, guess what Maxima li likes better? It also happens in courtrooms. This is a uh, Israeli courtroom, and they did a really cool study where they had a look at all the on parole decisions, that what you call it, that you're allowed to go out of jail uh, before you're, you're actually uh, allowed to. On parole decisions, they make a lot of those decisions. And they just aggregated all the data and had to plot it over the day. And they found out that um, in the beginning, when the judges start, quite a big percentage gets their own parole. But it lowers and it lowers until lunchtime. <laughs> and then it lowers and it lowers again until dinner time. And the, so they work at night, apparently. This is depletion at work in court. Is that a problem? Yeah, probably. <laughs> okay, but we're not here talking about courts, we're talking about mobile. Mobile has a thing to it, and that is, that's really, really different from a desktop. Um, it's very small, and it takes a lot of energy and effort to read the small text. We can measure in fMRI scans that it costs more effort to read the small text than it does on a desktop. So it gets depleted more quickly, and there's even more things to it. Typing on it is also a lot more hassle with your stupid thumb, and instead of rakatakatak, which is also already a complete habit, where you, this will become more and more a habit as well. You see it with young people, it's, it's, it's less of a difference. But still, this is more easy, the old good keyboard. And there's another thing. I do that a lot. I'm also texting while driving. I'm sorry, I gotta get rid of that. But it's typical Maxima behavior, because she wants to answer that friend who says like, hey, I come over to the bar, and, and I just have to answer it, and my Willem goes, oh, he might kill someone, and you will regret it the rest of your life, and he's right, I don't want to be a killer. Apparently I am, because I did answer the text. And I am going to stop it. Don Ariely has the same problem, so I feel like, oh, and Dan is not able to do it. But look at this environment. You know, Willem is only able to focus on one thing, so he's and taking control of the bike and, and trying to answer that message. People are, when we look at data, they are, there's a certain, this is a typical uh, uh, client, where you can see that mobile is often like on-the-go behavior. Right? It's, it's relatively more during getting to work and getting back from work. Um, in Google Think, you can see pictures like this, where you find that uh, at home we use a lot of phones, in the Netherlands at least, but then on the go, and there's a whole lot of other very distracting, noisy surroundings where we try to use our mobile phone. Or we actually use it. Our rational, conscious part of the brain is very, very easily distracted. And that makes it a whole different ball game. So when we enter clients and we see graphs like this, this is just conversion rate relative. And you see it dripping, and maybe when we've had dinner, it comes up again a bit, or another one, you see it going down. Then we know, ooh, this is a depletion issue. We even make graphs, I mean, it looks very difficult, graphs like this, where you can see that. During the day, we're fine, but conversion rates drop at night. Oh, okay. Monday, big killer, and then it goes down, and in the weekend, in the weekend, we like to relax. We don't want to spend our rational consciousness think, thinking. We just want to enjoy ourselves, be emotional, have fun. That's the weekend behavior. So I see a lot of those low conversion rates. That's why you should always test the week. Yeah, that's, that only is true if you have a graph like this, where the weekend is very different. And one of the reasons why that's happening is because we have so much less villain at the other side of the digital dialogue. So, complicated story, what do we test? A very simple test. Just as a small example, this is typically a client which has a depletion problem. And we said like, you know, this, this button, it's too far down, let's just put it above the fold, you know, the easy trick. 
Will it increase conversion? Yes, it does. But what's very, very interesting, at least as a psychologist, is that it only uplifts people who buy the same day. In one or maximum three sessions, if there are more sessions, nothing happens. If the decision takes more than a day, nothing happens with this variation. If people are clicking more than eight pages, there's no, no difference with or without the button. And that's typically Willem. Because Willem is very, has a very short attention span. He's not, he doesn't like to click around and see all the pictures of the hotel. He likes to you know, get down to the business. How much is it costing? And that's, that's his part of the decision. So we have, we have a depletion problem. And that's a real interesting insight. We can, as Chris Gower said, we, now we start testing that all around, also on the desktop. But in, on the desktop, we have less uh, uh, of a depletion problem, less of a distraction problem. Now, to make it even worse, he's not, he's not even, even just getting depleted during daytimes and during the week. Um, he's often just not there. I'm going to do a little mindfuck again. I'm telling you, which is true, that I have two boys. One of them, oh, no, I'm saying it wrong. I have two kids, sorry. Uh, I have two boys, so that's my I have two kids. One of them is a boy. If you would only know that, two kids, one boy. What's the chance of the other one being a boy, too? 50-50. Yeah, 50-50. No, it's one-third. Who can explain why it's only one third chance that the other one is a boy too? Yeah, it's easy. If you know it, it's easy. You got four options. I started with a boy, I had another boy, which happened. Uh, I had a boy, then a girl, I had a girl, then a boy, and I had a girl, then a girl. The last one's not an option because I had one boy. So I have three options left, which one has another boy and the other has a girl. Besides it. Uh, Monty Hall problem, the should you, uh, if you had that television program, you can win a car or a goat, should you switch the door you chose, same problem. <laughs> Willem is so bad in winning the rational decision, because Maxima says, I know boy girl, that's 50-50. Right? <laughs> and he has a real hard time thinking like, okay, now we'll just get back to the basic rational. So many options, blah, blah, blah. So that's why we answer 50. He loses it. And not only does he lose it um, in, in decision, he even loses it in perception. I have a, there are a lot of nice visual illusions. This is a typical one. It feels like the right one is tilted more to the right. It's, it's, it's tilted more, right? At least uh, it's a bit hard with the lines. These lines are, are interfering, right? But it's the same picture. Okay. <laughs> It's funny that the lines actually make the effect less. Uh, so, but even when you know it, you still see the illusion. It's impossible not to see the illusion. Uh, so he gets overruled. And that makes him feel really bad. And then what does he do? He goes and says, okay, Willem, if a Maxima, you decide. And you know what? I'll come up with my reasons later on, just to make myself feel good. We call it post-decision rationalization. Um, Michael Gazinaga, who was in the Netherlands two weeks ago, 20 people in the room, he did a lot of studies to people who have a split brain. Uh, we are lucky as psychologists that some people have spasms, epileptic, uh, and that's, that's just misfiring in the brain and it spreads from one hemisphere, the one half of the brain to the other via the corpus callosum, as this part. And what do neurologists do? They cut it. So the two hemispheres are no longer able to communicate with each other. Right? Um, vision, one half of the hemisphere sees one half of your visual field and the other one sees the other half. It crosses. So this part of the visual field enters this part of the brain, that part, that part, and then hands are controlled by, again, one part of the brain. This one controls that part, that one controls that. Don't ask me why it's, it's switched. And what did uh, uh, Gazinaga and the do uh, ask these split brain patients? They said, like, we'll show you a picture and you pick two cards. One card with each hand. Showed them a picture. Showed a bit longer. There's a chicken foot in here. And there's a snow-covered lane up there. 
and they pick a snow shovel and the head of a chicken. So far, so good. It's not a lot typical you notice about these people until you ask why. Why? No, we say, don't never ask why. Here's one reason why not. Um, because they answer, well, you know what? I took the chicken head because of the chicken food, and with the shovel I'm going to dig his poop. Why, <laughs> for God's sake, do they answer that they're going to dig poo with a snow shovel? There's a very funny thing about the left hemisphere, and that's that it is the location where language is processed. Broca and Nike are formulating and interpreting language. So when we ask people with language, only this part of the brain will get what we're asking. Only this part will answer the question. And that part saw, saw only the chicken food. It never sh saw the, ch the snow-covered lane. And that's why people answer the chicken food correctly. But they don't say, ooh, the snow shovel, I have no clue. I can't ask that other part of the brain anymore. There's, there's, there's corpus callosumus. No. It just comes up with a reason. That feels a lot better than not knowing. And that's all we, we call it post-decision rationalization. Most of your decisions are post-decision rationalized. You know why I bought the product? One, two, three. Bullshit. That's not why you bought it. That's what your consciousness makes you think why you bought it, just to feel good. I like to call our consciousness our comfortness. Of ons bewustzijn gerustzijn for the rich folks around here. Because since there's so money. Um, that's another recent finding. That's, that's actually pretty old. Leon Festinger already said, we're not rational beings. We are post-decision rationalizing beings. So energy is drained. Willem is gone. Third thing I want to tell you. He needs attention. He needs to put his focus of attention on one thing in order to process the information that involves uh, uh, that part. You probably know this test. Uh, you have to count how many times a basketball team is throwing the ball. And you have to pay attention to this. But you know it, right? Who, who, who knows it? Half of you doesn't. We'll do it. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! We got one, two, three. The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? Here he comes. <laughs> I'll make it even worse. I, oh, I'm going to tell you up front, things are going to be changed. Um, please try to find the things that they're changing, right? So you don't have to pay attention on who murdered Lord Smythe. Just try to find out what are they changing in this room. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. But, but, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. Why not? It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? <laughs> uh, I 
Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the last... Oh, you get it. We need to know where to focus our attention in order to be able to become consciously aware of something. The room you're seeing right now, this bubble of reality, is not really seen by your brain. It's made up by your brain. Right? It's not really there. We all see a different room. It's like a sort of Google algorithm. There's only a very small part used in order to produce that image. And that's really cool because then the brain processes uh, less, less energy, right? Instead of using the eyes, it just it makes it up. Henry Markram, one of the people who does a $40 million project on the brain, um, says how many of the visual awareness is actually visual input. When you walk up to a door and you open it, what you compulsively have to do to proceed is to make decisions. Thousands of decisions about the size of the room, the walls, the height, the objects in this room. 99% of what you see is not what comes in through the eyes. It is what you infer about that room. There's one cool thing about mobile, and that is this 1%, right? That is in the whole visual uh, area. There's a part of our eye, which is called the fovea, it's about the size of a thumbnail on an arm length. That is more concentrated. It's the only part where you can really see detail, color. Um, I'm not going to explain how that works. But compared to a screen, especially a small screen like an iPhone, it's a bigger part than on a desktop. So we actually have an awareness that sees more of the page than on a desktop. Right? We run a lot of tests on, on, on normal websites. No effects, you know, I just, just not uh, uh, experienced, perceived at all. Everything you test on the mobile is probably seen for real. Uh, that, that's, that's one of the cool things about mobile. Um, and where Willem is actually better than on, the, uh, than on the desktop. Now, Willem is sometimes needed for perception when Maxima is unable to perceive uh, the reality uh, uh, correctly. And this is, I think, the last mindfuck. Yeah, probably. I'm going to ask you to watch it, uh, to look at faces. Um, but at first instant, you just look at the little cross. Oh, I want to skip that one. Uh, just look here. And when you see really grotesque faces, really ugly faces, then look at the faces, whether they're ugly or not. Just look at the plus. And when the eyes are really ugly, or the foreheads, and look at the faces. Because they're actually really normal faces. I don't know whether it works really good in this distance. But this is a re really creepy. <laughs> uh, but what ha what's happening is really interesting. Because we, we call it fast and slow, the two systems. But we find out more and more that our fast system is actually not that fast. There's a, a Dutch uh, professor, Abdijkstehuis, who does really cool research into the speed of our subconsciousness. And what's happening here is that the faces just change too quickly. They're on both sides of the uh, visual field. There's only Maxima who's perceiving them. She tries to get hold of the faces. There's only one part of the brain involved in face recognition, um, totally de dedicated to faces and very complicated structures. And she starts mixing them up. So you see these eyes on that face and the other way around, and it's just a total uh, mess. Until Willem says, we're going to pay attention only to these faces, right? So you no longer see those ones. You're going to consciously look at these faces, and then it's fine. And that's really cool about Willem. When he takes control, um, you, your conscious awareness is uh, improving. But he needs to pay attention. On a mobile phone, people... We are in surroundings that are so distracting. Right? There's so much happening around when we're on the move and we're uh, in public transport. You know, maybe at home or at work, it's, it's getting less. 
but the mobile phone is used everywhere. And therefore, it's a lot, lot more difficult to actually have Willem on a mobile phone talking to you. We have a hard time believing that because um, we think our conscious awareness is in control, right? We even blame people for their behavior because, oh, Bart was late? Yeah, that's what Bart is like. Right? Whereas maybe, maybe you're right, could, could very well be, but maybe there was either a storm uh, going over or my flight was delayed and there were external factors influencing my behavior. And external factors are actually the biggest influencer of our uh, uh, behavior. So all these influences are busy and uh, Willem has a real hard time focusing. Especially because on that small screen, yeah, I tried to make it Android, but yeah, I only have an iPhone, so I had to make my, a screen of my own phone. <laughs> but in order to please you, I had the other one around in the case. Sorry for that. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you can see it as a screen. Just, uh, but there's an, like, like a bombardment of things drawing maximum attention. You, you get alerts everywhere, and they're all social. They're all focused on relationship. And Bill doesn't care about relationships. He's rational, right? He's only asking, what's in it for me? Where Maxima goes, oh, yeah, that was a nice bloke. And, uh, I want to date with him, and uh, whatever. It's all subconscious, right? So that makes it really hard to, on that small screen, actually get his attention. And that's why we start digging into the data and we find things like this, like this you know, on, on desktops, some of our clients, most of them, have longer sessions, more pages viewed than on tablet, than on mobile. Right? It's, it's, it's more quick behavior. It's less goal-directed than I'm going to read your pages and I'm going from A to Z. It's more, doo -doo 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 -doo, and that usually leads to more, more pages. We even see when we have take the uh, service provider, it's getting more and more difficult. But when we split, like, like are you on a GSM network or versus Wi-Fi, we even see a difference there on mobile, getting shorter times because people are on the move, uh, maybe even biking or driving a car. You get this typical, uh, huge differences in session times and... But when Willem has to be on the table, like this is, I think, a hotel booking site. Well, I'm not allowed to show the real numbers. I think this is a hotel booking site. Then, um, then our conscious awareness pops in and says, oh, whoa, whoa, wait, 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 what are we going to do? I want to first see this and that and that, and then I fill in details or not. And then you see a whole different game. We often see that then the people who book, even before they book, take a lot more pages and session time before they uh, actually book on mobile, because it's so much more difficult. And that tells us, hey, wow, 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 this is probably a site where we need Willem to make, uh, make the difference. We have other clients where you have the opposite going on, like these are the desktop sessions and the pages, and, and on mobile they get more long. Those are the publishers and the social platforms where Maxima is ruling. She is much more interested in, in, on a mobile device. It's a completely social device, right? It started off as a, as a, as a way to be able to talk across, like sort of tele... That's why it's called telephone. But it, it started off social. This started off very non-social. That was work. And it's still, still happening. So what do you test then? Well, here I have a... Uh, uh, I, I took this one because it was, it was in one of your presentations. It's one of my clients, so I like that. They had an optimized uh, 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 or at least responsive website. I'm not very fond of responsive website. I'll tell you why. We had a little small discussion with someone. If you have a lot of repeat visitors, you're cre creating habits. You have all the banks, I, I work for all the banks in the Netherlands, they all have a responsive uh, website now. They all decrease their conversion rates because, hey, why? We have this habit behavior, and now I'm on this device, and I'm this, and I use three, four devices, and each and every time, it's different. And I have to create a new habit. If you have a lot of heavy users, don't go responsive. That it makes it different every time. Right? So, but we had this form, which was not really optimized, easy going. We make that one like this, better optimized. Yeah, huge increase in conversions, but especially on mobile. And then we go, is that because it's 
optimized for mobile? I would say, no, 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 this is optimized for, for Willem. This is a lot less effort he's putting in there. And I'm not allowed to show the data, but this page makes a difference um, in, in, uh, in the repeat visits um, and, the, the, and the very small visits, all these indicators of system two. Right? Short, little pages, very goal-directed, because goal-directed is very conscious. On the other hand, and so here, here I would agree with most people who say, yeah, you have to always take away all the friction. Yeah, but that's not always true. Uh, we did the test with add a button. We always test with just deleting the button as well. This is a more of a redesign. But this is typically a Maxima site, a deal site. She clicks around on mobile even more than on other devices. We go, hey, this is a Maxima site. Let's see, she doesn't care about Bob now. She wants to be entertained first. So we did a redesign with take away the button. And yeah, that increased conversions um, for the non-mobile just a little bit, but for mobile a hell of a lot. And then we have our eBay, but it's called Marktplatz in Netherlands. Where well, again, this is also the deals environment, so hey, it's probably Maxima again. We want you to fill in your email address. Well, that doesn't work because it's not very popping, so we just make it pop up. That makes a lot of difference. But what also happens is we sell more. So not only more email addresses, but we also sell more. Uh, why is that? We have a hypothesis for that. Because I showed you this test in the beginning with the pop-up. We've tested a hell of a lot of pop-ups because we had the cookie consent, because we're doing customer research where we ask questions and there's a pop-up, do you want to participate? And even this one where there's just no content, it's just a script gra grabbing this picture, putting it in a light box and tell them go to the website. What's happening is that people touch the, web the, touch the website, right? You were just asked to talk to each other. If I would ask you to touch each other and I would scan your brain, there would be a lot of things happening in the brain. That even happens digitally. Maxima loves to touch each other. And that's why this one wins. And it doesn't matter who you are. As long as you touch her, you kiss her, she'll fall in love with you. <laughs> I should have been able to do that, right? So it's a good thing that he's in our brain too. Because otherwise we two would just be animals behaving really, really, really irrational. And I'm very, very glad that we have them both in our brain. And that's what I hope you will appreciate more and more in your own brain and in your customer brain as well. Thank you. Wait, 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 wait. Always be measuring, excuse me. I measure the, uh, the amount of applause so I can see whether I'm performing better or not. Where's my app? Can you do that again for me? <laughs> a, lot, a lot better than last week. Thank you. Um, I do still have 10 minutes, so I'm going to do both questions and something else, because I, I have one request, people. Your brain is a lazy liar, right? That's a bit the bottom line of the story. And it very much believes stories. Hey, I told you a story. It's about Vitamin Maxima. It feels very good. But it believes stories more than the truth. And I want you to believe the truth and not some stupid stories. So never believe what your conscious part of your brain is telling you. Never believe speakers. <laughs> but do believe at least the science a little bit, but even more your data. You have a Walhalla for science out there. When you have huge numbers, and you probably have, because you're not allowed to be here when you have a small Edwards budget, so I think you have lots of data. <laughs> <laughs> then you have a digital Walhalla where you can just start digging into the data, you know, big time. Dig, dig. What kind of behavior do we have? Is it Willem? Is it Maxima? And I can help you to go even more deep. Then start experimenting. Analyze the behavior. Experiment. Watch out, most A-B tests are just completely wrong. Our lies are statistical ghosts. You have, we, have to, we really have to grow our business first here. Right? Mobile is not our biggest problem. This is our biggest problem. Maybe I'll ask you some questions about that. But then when you start experiencing, you'll learn more and more about how the brain of a customer and maybe your own brain 
is working. And yeah, you need a psychologist to help you with the, the test, and, but please help psychology as well with the test. We should exchange it much, much more and grow our knowledge of the uh, brain together. So that was my ask for you. And now I'm, I'm allowed to throw it with uh, this one. So who has the guts to ask a question? Watch out, because I'm going to ask you questions otherwise, right? I have a few prepared. I saw the I saw him. Uh, oh, pass it on. Okay, so I'm just really interested to know of are you, 31. Are you, see, we were wondering, are you talking in his ass? <laughs> Speaking into his head, I believe. Oh, in his head, all oh, right. His brain, actually. Brain. Yeah, thank you. Excuse <laughs> me for that. So, of your 31,074 new emails, which one do you, do you read first? I'm just interested to know. <laughs> so, I have a solution for that, and she's called Nienke. And she is uh, marking the emails that I should actually read, and the rest is there. Uh, she, she condemned them because I will never read them. That's my solution. <laughs> okay. And, and she's my guardian angel. Yeah. Nienke, if you hear this, thank you. If there are no other questions, I'm going to ask you some questions, because I heard some really, really bad things. Um, whom of you is A-B testing? Well, 80%. Right. I heard remarks about uh, sample size and significance and blah, blah, blah. Uh, who knows what significance is? We all know that, right? Yeah. Who knows what power is? Yeah, a few hands. Are, well, that's one, are you one company? Yeah, you're the guys I want to work with. Because the rest is not very good at testing. If you don't know the power of your test, you're not able to do, uh, to do good tests. I heard, uh, so you dig into that. What's power? It's about, uh, about false uh, negatives. Um, there's another thing like, uh, we would stop the test when it's significant. Do I have internet? I heard Googling, Google, uh, no, booking.com is around here, right? Yeah, woo cool, right? Very good. You have somebody w working for you, which I really, really love. And it's called Lucas Vermeer. He's one of your data scientists. And he made this uh, simulation. What it does is that it is AA testing. That's in itself a very cool thing, AA testing. So you make a copy of the default variation. And you make a variation, but you do not change anything, right? So you've got two tests, two variations, but they're exactly the same. So that's a unique situation. We know there's no difference. And then he starts testing with, let's say, uh, p-value is uh, 0.1, which is, you have to put it to 0.05. I will not take the hassle. I'll just start the simulation. Let's run 100 AA tests. So it's just, you know, random testing. You expect with a p-value of 0.1 to end to have 10 tests which have, are wrong, and they, they show a significant result, whereas and we know in reality there's not. So they end up 11. That's fine. There were 59 tests that were at some point significant. This is a huge problem. This is why at least 60% of A-B tests are wrong, because the tools tell you, hey, you got a winner. And it's just a statistical growth. The t-test, which you're using here, is not meant to track uh, the data all along. There are different tests for that. It's, you're only allowed to, to say up front, okay, I'll be testing two weeks, and then after two weeks, that's when I do my check, one time. And then you have 90% of it, I hope 95% significance. So I hope you're gonna, and there are like 23 or 25 at least other mistakes I, uh, that, you, uh, that, you, that we really have to start changing because you know that boss, that hippo, that is telling you, um, I don't believe your AA, t your AB testing, um, I know for sure it's that way, he's probably right because your A-B tests are wrong. Save our business, get into statistics, it's not a very sexy thing. It's Willem who has to learn about statistics. I know it's hard, but it's the only way to save our business, because if we want zero to grow to really growth hacking style, we, we make uh, companies grow a hockey stick, we have to do A-B tests that are true. Right? Dig into that. I saw another question, yeah. Ooh. So you yeah. mentioned that 
most of the tests are wrong. So yeah. is that the statistical side or the, the initial concept uh, of the test or the measurement? Uh, so the, when I say 70%, it's also based just on my experience, right? And that's because I'm, I'm, I think, one of the more expensive uh, conversion companies, and so I'm not uh, hired as the first company. And then at some point, the boss goes, like, it's not working. You know, like, all these 28%, 48%, and, but I just see it flat or maybe going down. I mean, what's happening? And then they're willing to pay more, and then when I come in. Because <laughs> I'm actually in the business of separating companies from money, right? And that's where I pay my mortgage from. <laughs> Uh, and then I see that, you know, they make these mistakes, and that's why I think like 70% of the tests are wrong. The issue is, I can't tell you which 70%. So we'll have to do them all over again. You learned absolutely nothing. Big, big problem, right? And what goes wrong most? Statistics. Just plain statistics. And there are, there are other things, you know, multi-divide. We, we've got a lot of companies who go, uh, for you from this thing. Uh, we have uh, the... the Cumulative uh, uh, difference between the two, and they grow together all the time, all the time. All my tests end up not significant. Now, first of all, you're not allowed to track it, but second of all, probably you have a sample pollution problem. It's maybe, I think, the second problem. Because, yeah, we call them unique. We say this is variation A and B, but a lot of people see both. Because they're using multiple devices, in B2B you still have a lot of companies that flush their cookies, so every day you're a new user for me, uh, blah, 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 blah. There's a lot of issues to it. But first of all, statistics, Because right? yeah, <laughs> um, significance, well, rule of thumb, 100, 150 per variation. No, fuck it, wrong, absolutely wrong. It has to be much, much more. Sorry, guys, if you have a B2B environment with only small data, don't test. Chris Goward is right. I mean, if you test, make it big. But actually, you should test big because you want to have a lot of significant test results because you know, if, if the number of significant tests is low, you have only like 25 or 30 percent of significant tests, and you have 10 percent uh, of the tests where you know sh for sure that they're uh, uh, statistical ghosts, it's already one third. Yeah? And this is only the beginning of the statistical failures. It's, uh, but that's Willem. You know, we have to, Willem has to be enthusiastic as well. He, yeah, he should learn a lot more, and then we'll be able to grow uh, companies really, really in a true way. I saw more uh, hands, and I still have two minutes. Oh, the woman that made me say ass on stage. Yeah. <laughs> I'm wondering, can we get rid of our six personas, which I find rather old-fashioned anyway, and can I just do Willem and Lakshmana? Which six are you relating to? Oh, the yeah, the Sex in the City or... No, no. <laughs> six. How can we get rid of them? You mean f for yourself as a as a concept, like like a base framework to work from, or also to tell the hippo how it works? Both. Uh, I think that, that what I really like to do nowadays is um, to come at the company. We were also having the question about how much resources should we devote. Yeah? I'll start off with a small team, so big that your boss says, "Okay, I'm fine, invest it," and it's not going to cost me any money because what you should tell them is. Uh, all the revenue I'm generating, right, we put back into the team. That's a, that's a very, very easy way because it's not costing anything. It's boss hippo, it's free. And then when you do it correctly, statistically correctly, then you start re, uh, 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 putting the money back in when you have a winning test, and then you really start to grow. This is basically what all the growth hacking small startups are doing and what Booking is doing, and Airbnb and then Zalando. Um, but what I like to do is uh, we just make it a black box. We tell nobody anything for at least three months. So we can run like shitloads of tests. Uh, one of the first things I would do when I enter a company, what's the test capacity of the website? You know, because most companies can do like hundreds or thousands of tests that they're not aware, they're glad that they did 10, 20 tests, and whoa, it's way too little. And then we just go crazy within these three to four months, really starting to learn when is Maxima in the dialogue? When is Willem there? And I can because we can go a bit deeper than that, you know, and then really start to learn really cool things in, in, in a speed that science has never been able to do. And then after three months, we open up the box and we have a really cool story to tell that will totally change the business. Because we, uh, for example, uh, I'm doing this at ING Bank. Um, 
we get out and we can tell their investment products that they should totally do their value proposition different because we've done like 30 tests to find out what actually works the best. And it's a very autonomic uh, concept. So you're still in control of your own money, but you should let us do it in combination. With, that's a whole, and that's not how they were communicating it. And you know how much money that makes because we've been really, really thoroughly testing and retesting and making different variations. Another failure. One hypothesis, one A-B test. Ow. If you, in, in one test, there's so much different. If you, if you only change one word or you put one arrow, there's a lot of things already changing. Uh, so you have to retest and do reverse testing in order to become more sure of that this is actually the case. And then when you're really sure of what you think, then you go back to the boss and you open up and uh, you actually learn more about at least system one and system two. Uh, I'll be around in the bar uh, tonight. Um, thank you. I'm through my time, so see ya. Thank you very much, Bart. That was brilliant. Thank you.